My name is Lyle and I'm speaking to you from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory here in Pasadena, California. Today we're going to be talking about the moon. There are eight moon topics that we'll be discussing. You can see them behind my shoulder there. Before we get started though, I want you to think and talk amongst yourselves about what you know about the moon. So I want you to come up with three to five facts about the moon, things you know are true, uh, and share amongst your class and we'll come back in just a moment as soon as you do that. All right, welcome back. So you've had a moment to discuss some things you already know about the moon. And one of the first things that might have come up is where did the moon come from? So in other words, how did it get there or what is the origin of the moon? And that's what I want to talk about first. So let's take a look at that. To understand the origin of the moon, we have to go back nearly to the origin of Earth. 4.6 billion years ago, Earth, along with the rest of the solar system, was forming. About 100 billion years after that, or 4.5 billion years ago, the moon was formed by a giant collision with Earth. Now you have to understand that Earth at that time was a very different place than what it is today. It was much hotter, there was a lot more volcanic activity, and there was no life. And what we think happened is that something in the solar system, which again was very different from what it is today, crashed into Earth. We think that an object as large as Mars, not Mars itself, but an object that size, maybe even as big as Earth, slammed into Earth. And when it did, it created a very violent explosion. Now that collision, which we've modeled here, you can see, sprayed lots of material out into space. Some of that material came falling back to Earth, but a lot of it stayed in orbit around Earth. Eventually, chunks of that material collided with other chunks, and just like pieces of clay will stick together when you uh, push them together, these pieces formed into larger and larger chunks. These chunks also, as they got bigger, had enough gravity to attract some of the smaller chunks. And in a short period of time, the moon was formed and went into orbit around our planet. Now, it was very different from the moon that we know today. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a video that shows what the moon might have looked like four and a half billion years ago and how it came to look the way that it does today. So when it was first formed, the moon was still a very, very hot object. And this was about 4.5 billion years ago. The outer crust of the moon cooled relatively quickly. But keep in mind the inside was still quite hot. About 4.3 billion years ago, the largest impact to ever occur on the moon happened. That formed what we call the South Pole Aiken Basin. From about 4.1 to 3.8 billion years ago, the moon underwent heavy bombardment, what we call basin formation. And that molten material that was under the surface, that magma, was able to seep out through the cracks in the surface that were created by these impacts. As that magma came out, it filled the low-lying areas, and eventually, it would cool. This happened from about 3.8 to 1 billion years ago. As the magma or lava on the surface cooled, it created the dark areas that you can see even today. Now during that 3.8 to 1 billion, 1 billion year ago time period, the moon was also cratered by many, many asteroids that were crashing into it. About one billion years ago, the cratering that occurred for such a long period of time slowed quite a bit. Now there are still impacts occurring on the moon pretty regularly. But the activity that caused the moon to look that it, the way that it does today has mostly stopped. 
So there you have it. The moon was created 4.5 billion years ago by a giant collision between Earth and another object. And while it looked very different 4.5 billion years ago, it looks the way that it does today because of all of the activity that has happened over that time period. Okay, up next we're going to talk about the size and distance of the moon. So we'll start by talking about the distance of the moon. And in order to give you an idea of just how far away the moon is, I want you to imagine Earth is a basketball. So if you've ever seen or held a basketball, imagine that is the Earth. Now I want you to think for a minute about what object would be the moon compared to the basketball. So uh, I'll give you a moment to think about that. I'll give you a hint. I'm looking for some type of sports equipment. All right, so you've had a moment to talk about what piece of sports equipment might be the right size for a moon compared to our basketball earth. Maybe you said a volleyball or a soccer ball. Maybe you went smaller than that, thought a softball, baseball, tennis ball, maybe even a golf ball. Well, if you said a baseball or a tennis ball, which happen to be about the same size, you are correct. This is the size comparison between our baseball moon and our basketball earth. In order to show how far apart they are, however, you'd have to put them not one foot, not two feet, not even three feet apart. You'd actually have to stretch the distance out between these two to about 25 feet apart. So next time you have a basketball and a baseball um, and a measuring tape, put them about 25 feet apart to give you an idea of just how far apart those objects are. Obviously the, ba uh, obviously the moon is not 25 feet away, so how far is it to the moon? Now, I'm going to give you some answer choices, and I want you to just think about them in your head for a moment. So, our answer choices are 10,000 miles, 25,000 miles, 250,000 miles, or 500,000 miles. Think about those in your head for just a moment. When you think you have the answer, I want you to, instead of raising your hand to tell your teacher, I want you to whisper it to your neighbor. The reason I'm asking you to whisper it to your neighbor is so that you know what you chose, but also so your neighbor knows what you chose. And I'm going to ask everyone to carefully and quietly and calmly stand up in their seats. Now, I'm going to remove some of these answers. If I take away an answer choice that you chose, I need you to be honest and have a seat. Keep in mind, your neighbor knows if you are being honest as well because you told them your answer choice. At the end, those of you that remain standing will be standing because your answer will be on the screen. So if you chose 500,000 miles, please have a seat. If you chose 10,000 miles, please have a seat. So we have 25,000 miles or 250,000 miles as our remaining distances between Earth and the Moon. If you chose 25,000 miles, please have a seat, meaning if you chose 250,000 miles, you have chosen correctly. Nicely done. Now, now 250,000 miles is quite a long distance. That's like driving around Earth 10 times at the equator. Now, 250,000 miles is an average distance, and I say average because the Moon does not orbit Earth in a perfect circle it goes in an orbit that is in a shape called an ellipse. Almost looks like a circle, sort of tilted on its side, or a smoosh circle. And so when we look at an orbit of the moon, now I had to squish them together because they're not actually this close, otherwise they wouldn't fit on the screen. But the general shape is here of the orbit. You can see that it would travel in an ellipse, sort of a smooshed circle. Now there are two points that I want you to notice in this orbit. There's the point where the moon is closest to Earth, and that is called its perigee, right there. And there's a point where the moon is furthest from Earth in its orbit, and that is called its apogee, right there. Keep that in mind as we talk about these distances and as we talk about the moon orbiting around Earth. Now I mentioned that the moon is not as close as it appears here. So to help us get an understanding of just how far 250,000 miles away is, I'm going to show you a picture. This picture was taken by the Galileo spacecraft as it was on its way to Jupiter. As it was leaving Earth, it turned around and it took a picture of Earth 
and the moon. And you can see them 250,000 miles apart. So here we have Earth, and 250,000 miles away, this little tiny speck is the moon. So that gives you some sort of idea of just how far apart they are. The reason that you will often see in books and pictures them squished so close together is because it's hard to see any detail when you look at the Earth and the moon together like this. So we're going to, of course, squish them together for this next piece so that you can see a little bit of detail here. We're going to use our imagination. I want you to think about road trips. Raise your hand if you've ever been on a road trip before. So you've gotten in the car and you've gone somewhere pretty far away. Maybe you've driven all day to get there. Maybe you've driven all day, stayed the night somewhere, and had to drive even further the next day. Well, imagine there is a road between Earth and the moon. And you wake up and your family says, all right, get in the car. We are going on a road trip. We are going to the moon. Well, you'll notice the road is straight. So you're going the most direct route you can to the moon. You'll also notice the speed limit is 70 miles per hour. So I want you to think for a minute, going 70 miles per hour, how long would it take you to get to the moon? Keep in mind there are no restaurants, so you will not be stopping between here and the moon. There are also no hotels, so you will not be sleeping between here and the moon. Well, you might be sleeping since if you're not old enough to drive, you'll be a passenger and you can take a nap. You'll also notice there are no rest stops, so no bathroom breaks either. I want you to think for a moment, how long do you think it will take you to get to the moon? So um, share your possible answers with your teacher and we'll come back in just a moment and reveal how long it would take at that speed to get to the moon. All right, you've had some time to think about how long it might take. If you were traveling at 70 miles per hour, it would take you 142 days, over four months to get to the moon. Now be glad I didn't ask you to walk or run because if you were running, and let's say you were running fast, five miles an hour, it would take you over five years to get to the moon. So think about whatever grade you are in right now and add five to that, you'd be pretty old by the time you got there. Now, five years to get to the moon running. Four months to get to the moon in a car. If you were in an airplane, it would still take you three weeks. Yet the astronauts that went to the moon during the Apollo missions were able to get there in only three days. How were they able to do that? I'll give you a moment to think about that. If you mentioned that the astronauts were traveling in a spacecraft that was launched using the largest rocket ever built, you're on to something. The reason astronauts were able to get to the moon in only three days is because their spacecraft was traveling 25,000 miles per hour launched atop the Saturn V rocket. So that's how you are able to cover such a great distance in a short amount of time. All right, so that wraps it up for our distance section. Okay, next we're going to be talking about the size of the moon. Now we talked about the basketball-baseball size comparison, uh, but I want you to think again back to the fact that the moon does not orbit Earth in a perfect circular orbit. Remember, it's going around an ellipse, it reaches a close point called perigee, and a distant point called the apogee. And if you think about how something looks when it's close to you or when it's far away, you'll kind of understand what we're going to talk about next. When the moon is further away, it appears smaller. Not much smaller, but a little smaller. As to when it is closer at its perigee, and it appears larger. Again, not much larger, but a little bit. Let's take a look at this image right here. These are pictures of the full moon, and one of these full moons occurred when the moon was at its apogee, when it was further away. The one on the right was taken at its perigee when it was much closer. When it was closer, it appeared larger. When it was further away, it appeared smaller. In fact, it appeared 12% smaller. As a result, we get from time to time something that you might have heard of called a supermoon. A supermoon is simply a full moon that occurs when the moon is at its perigee, and it appears bigger and brighter in the night sky. It's not something that you'd probably be able to notice with your unaided eye, but if you have a telescope and you're able to measure the diameter of these moons, you would notice uh, a difference between the apogee full moon and the perigee full moon. 
you can look on a calendar and see when a full moon is occurring and you can also look on a calendar and find out when the moon will be at its perigee or apogee and you can figure out for yourself when we will have a supermoon or when we might not be having a supermoon. Now you might have also seen the moon low on the horizon at times and thought it looks very very large and then maybe later in the evening you looked up in the sky and you thought well the moon doesn't look quite so big. So what's happening? Is the moon growing? Is the moon shrinking? Well, what's happening is your eyes and your mind are playing a trick on you. Your brain knows that things like mountains and trees and buildings that you would see low on the horizon are big. And when it sees the moon next to those things, it automatically makes you think, well, that moon must also be big. When it's up high in the night sky, there is nothing around it for your brain to compare it to. So when your brain sees the moon up high in the sky, it just sees this small circular object and thinks, well, it's not that big, but you can do a little bit of a test. Next time there is a full moon, right around sunset, you're going to look in the opposite direction and see the full moon rising. Take an M&M, or if you don't like M&Ms, you can use Skittles, or if you don't like either of those, you can use Reese's Pieces. Any small round candy about the right size will work. So you'll take it and you'll hold it in your arms and you'll close one eye and you'll cover the moon with that candy and you'll move the candy right next to it and you'll see they're about the same size even though the moon may look huge next to a mountain or a building. Then, you know, here's the hard part, don't eat the candy. You're going to come back a few hours later when the moon is overhead and far away from the horizon. You'll take that candy, you'll hold it again at arm's length, close one eye, and when you look up you'll see that the moon is still the same size compared to that candy. So the illusion that it's larger is caused simply because it is close to the horizon and near a very large object. All right, so we were talking about comparing the moon with a piece of candy. Now we're going to compare the moon with Earth. So let's take a look right here. I want to ask you, which is the correct size comparison between Earth and the moon? You can see a few different options here, and like before, I want you to just think about the answer in your head, and when you've got an answer choice, I want you to whisper it to your neighbor. Unlike before, when I ask you to stand in your seat, this time I'm going to ask you to put your hands on your head, and if I take away your answer, just go ahead and take your hands and put them in your lap. So let's start removing some of these answers that are not the correct size comparison between Earth and the Moon. If you chose B, with the Moon being a little bit bigger than Earth, go ahead and put your hands down. If you chose C, with the moon being a lot bigger, put your hands down. If you chose A, with Earth and the moon being the same size, please put your hands down. If you look around the room, we have some hands up for people who remembered the basketball-baseball comparison, knowing that the moon is smaller than Earth. But how much smaller? That's the question. If you chose F, put your hands down. If you chose D, please put your hands down, meaning that E is the correct size comparison between Earth and the Moon. Now that still doesn't tell us how big the Moon actually is. We've only compared it to things so far. So let's look again at Earth and the Moon. Earth has a diameter, so a line running from one side to the other, directly through the center, of about 8,000 miles. The moon has a diameter, again a line running from one side to the other directly through the center, of about 2,000 miles. So think in your heads for a moment, how many times larger is Earth than the moon? For our younger audience, if you're not using multiplication, Think about counting by twos, because if you can count by two, you can count by two thousands. Give you a moment to think about that. All right, now you've had a moment to think about that. Earth's diameter is about four times the diameter of the moon, meaning that we could fit one, two, three, four moons right across the middle of our planet. Next I want to talk about how much land there is on the moon. You'll notice on Earth we're covered with lots of water. In fact, 70% of Earth is covered by water. But on the moon, 
there is no liquid water ocean. So all of that land is available to perhaps walk around on. So what I want to know from you is how much land is on the moon? We've taken all of the continents on Earth and sort of shifted them around to make it a little bit easier for you to see. You've got North America, South America, Africa, Antarctica, Australia, Asia, and Europe. Which continent do you think has the same amount of land space as the moon? I'll give you a moment to think about that. All right, now that you've had time to think about it, let me share with you that the moon has about the same amount of land as Africa. If you were thinking Antarctica, keep in mind that while they look similar in this image, the moon is a sphere. It has a round shape with a lot of surface area, and that's why we've got as much of an area as you can see there. All right, the last thing we're going to talk about in terms of the size of the moon has to do with its mass. And the mass is just a measurement of how much stuff makes up the moon. And when we compare it to Earth, I want to know how many moons would it take to balance Earth. And I'm going to give you a few options. Four moons, 22 moons, 81 moons, or 100 moons. Again, I'm going to ask you to think about some of these choices and select one. Whisper it to your neighbor. And this time, instead of standing up at your seat or putting your hands on your head, I want you to put your hands behind your head and just sort of relax for a minute. You've been thinking hard. I'm going to take away some of these answers. If I take away the answer that you chose, please put your hands in your lap. So if you chose 100 moons, please put your hands down. If you chose four moons, please put your hands down. If you chose 22 moons, please put your hands down, meaning if you chose 81 moons, you chose the correct answer. It's actually just over 81 moons. That's why we've got that fraction of a moon up at the top. And you might be thinking, why does it take so many moons to balance the mass of the Earth? Well, it's because Earth has a very, very large iron nickel core. It makes up about 33% of the mass of Earth. The moon has a very small iron nickel core. And if you've ever picked up a piece of iron, you know that it is very dense and very heavy, so we need a lot of moons to make up for the mass of Earth. All right, well, that does it for the size of the moon. Let's go back to our moon topic. Next, we're going to talk about the phases of the moon. If you look at the moon tonight and look at the moon in one week from now, what you'll see will be different. And if you look at it again in another week, it will again be different. And those changes that we see from night to night and over the course of several weeks are the phases that the moon goes through. You might be familiar with a picture that looks something like this where you can see the moon in all of its different phases. And I'm going to ask someone or all of you in the class to think about how long you think it takes for the moon to go through one complete cycle of its phases. So in other words, to go from this phase all the way to a full moon and then back to a new moon and start over again. So I'll give you a moment to think about that. All right, you've had a chance to think about it. Let's talk about how long it takes to go from one phase to the exact same phase in the next cycle of the moon. It takes 29.5 days. Now, in order for us to understand why we see phases and how the phases change, we need to understand that everything in our solar system, the moon, Earth, all of the other planets, have a light side and a dark side. The light side is the side that faces the sun, and the dark side is the side that faces away from the sun. So let's take a look at what that might look. Here we can see the sun shining its light on Earth and the moon. And you can see the light is shining on the light side and there is shade on the dark side. So we're going to move the sun out of the way because remember it is quite far. But keep in mind the light is shining in the direction that those arrows are pointing. Also keep in mind that the moon orbits Earth. And when we look at the moon, we can only see the side of the moon facing Earth. And I've 
made this circle here so that you can imagine whenever the moon is orbiting Earth, wherever it is, we can only see the side on the inside of that circle. We can't see what's on the other side because we're looking at it in this direction. So in this particular case, we would see a moon that looks like it is half lit and half dark. And we call that the first quarter moon. Now as the moon moves, we would see a moon that is mostly lit and a little bit dark. We call that the waxing gibbous. The next phase is the full moon. And the full moon is what we see when the side of the moon that is lit up faces Earth and the side that is shaded does not face Earth at all. Again, as the moon moves in its orbit, next we see a little bit of that shade starting to show up on the side that we can see. This is the waning gibbous moon. The moon moves into its last quarter phase and during the last quarter of the side of the moon that we can see, half of it is lit and half of it is dark. Now we move into the waning crescent phase. The waning crescent phase shows most of the moon that we can see in the shade, meaning we only see a small sliver of the moon, and that's when we get to see those crescent phases. The new moon is a phase that we cannot see, and that's because the sun shines on the moon on the side that we cannot see. After that, we start to see a little bit more of the side with light on it move in to the side we can see. And eventually, we will see all of these phases. We can look at it another way using this computer program. And if I hit start, you'll see the moon start to move around. And when it does, again, you can see we're looking at it through this line right here. The sun is off in the distance, and the side facing the sun is lit, and the side facing us is dark. There's only a little bit of light that you can see right here, and that's when we get this crescent right here of the moon. I'll press start again, and when the moon moves to this point right here, the side facing us is completely dark, so we don't see anything, and that's our new moon phase. As the moon moves, the side that is lit always faces the sun. Sometimes that side faces Earth and we get the full moon. Sometimes that side is lit and we see the new moon. That wraps up our talk about phases of the moon. Let's go back to our moon topics. Now I'd like to talk about eclipses. And before we do that, I want you to just think about this experience that you may have had before. Imagine you're in a movie theater and somebody sits in front of you and maybe they're really tall or they're wearing a big hat or maybe they've got really puffy hair and they block the screen from you being able to see. How many of you have ever had that happen to you? Okay. Uh, now I want you to imagine the other situation where you are that person who's tall uh, or is wearing a big hat or has puffy hair that blocks somebody's view from the screen and they say hey down in front can you you know get out of the way sort of thing well the so that situation where one thing is blocking another thing is kind of what's happening during an eclipse now eclipses can happen during full moons and they can happen during new moons as we discussed earlier everything in our solar system has a light side and a dark side but everything in our solar system is also casting a shadow. Now during a new moon, that shadow can hit Earth, and if it does, we get what is called a solar eclipse. Now the moon is casting a shadow, but so is Earth. And if the moon happens to move into the shadow of Earth, we get what is called a lunar eclipse. And let's talk a little bit about why that happens. But keep in mind, every new moon does not mean we're going to have an eclipse, and every full moon does not result in an eclipse. We'll talk a little bit more about why that is in a few moments. Now here you can see the Sun, Earth, and Moon. Of course, these are not the right sizes or the right distances, but we wanted to be able to show you what's happening. Now sunlight is shining from the Sun towards Earth in all directions, and what it does is it creates two different kinds of shadows. It creates an area called a penumbra, 
and a penumbra is an area of shade that has a little bit of light coming in because if you look here you can see there will be light coming from this direction over here that will fill in a little bit of this shadow with some light. However this area called the umbra gets no light because the earth completely blocks the sunlight coming from this direction. And this represents a lunar eclipse and let's look at what the moon looks like during a lunar eclipse. So the moon moves through these shadows traveling eastward. It enters the penumbra and it starts to get a little bit dark. That's because the shadow I mentioned earlier has a little bit of light still in it. But when it moves into the umbra it does something unexpected. Rather than get completely dark it turns red. Now this process can take a few hours to go from one side of the shadow to the other side but as the moon moves out it will lose that reddish color and once it exits the shadow the eclipse is over and the moon will look as we're used to seeing it during a full moon. A lot of people wonder well why is the moon red during an eclipse? Well that has to do with a phenomenon that you may be familiar with. If you've ever shined a light through a prism you've seen the way that it will break that white light up into the colors of the rainbow, well our atmosphere acts kind of like that prism. White light from the sun hits the atmosphere. The blue light scatters into the atmosphere and that's why we see a blue sky. And it scatters the red light into the shadow and that is why we see the red light during a lunar eclipse. Now let's talk about a solar eclipse. The first thing that I want to talk about with solar eclipses are the sizes of some of these different objects that are involved. Now the sun is much, much bigger than the moon. In fact, the moon is so small that we sort of had to make it a little bit bigger than it actually is just to make it visible in this picture. However, sometimes when we see the sun and the moon in the sky at the same time, they appear to be the same size. And that has to do with what we talked about earlier when we said something that's further away appears smaller and something that's closer appears bigger. And we can do a little experiment to test that out. If you bend your elbow, put your thumb up and keep it about a foot away from your eye, you're going to close one eye, turn to your neighbor and you'll notice that maybe your thumb is able to cover up their shoulder or their head. Now I want you to turn to somebody else across the room, find the person furthest away from you, do the same thing. What you'll notice is that even though your thumb did not get really big, the person across the room did not shrink, they appear to be smaller. The same sort of thing is happening with the sun in this situation. The sun and the moon are at just the right distances that they appear to be the same size. To give you an idea of just how big Earth, the moon, and the sun are compared to each other, we can look at this close-up view of the sun and we can see compared to the sun, Earth is quite small and the moon is even smaller. Fortunately for us we're not quite this close to the sun so we don't have to worry about it. Now let's take a close look at what's happening during a solar eclipse. Just as before we have the sun, the moon, and earth all involved. The sunlight is shining down on earth and it's casting a shadow but the sunlight comes from all directions so again we have two different types of shadows. We have the penumbra and as before, there's some light that shines from the sun that fills in the penumbra. Then we also have an umbra. And the umbra is an area that doesn't have any sunlight getting into it. Now you'll notice that the umbra, in the case of a solar eclipse, forms a point right where it touches Earth. Now, if you happen to be on the International Space Station orbiting Earth, you can see that point of the shadow as a dark circle on Earth. And if you happen to be inside that dark circle, you are able to see the solar eclipse. That's one difference between a solar eclipse and a lunar eclipse. A lunar eclipse, you can see those as long as you're on the nighttime side of Earth and you have a clear sky. For a solar eclipse, you have to be at just the right spot on the planet where that shadow is falling. Now what does it look like when you see a solar eclipse? Well, keep in mind, the sun and the moon are in the sky. In order to look at an eclipse, you have to wear special glasses. Those special glasses will make the sky very dark. Also keep in mind that this is the new moon phase, so the side of the moon facing us is completely dark and we will not see it. Now what's going to happen is the moon is going to pass in front of the sun and block it out completely. That glow that you see, that is the corona 
or the atmosphere of the sun that we normally can't see, but now we can see it because the rest of the sun that is otherwise so bright is being blocked out. Now, that is a total solar eclipse of the sun. But something else can happen. Keep in mind that what we talked about earlier can have an effect on solar eclipses. So remember, the moon does not orbit in a perfect circle. It orbits in what we call an ellipse. And when the moon is further away, during its apogee, you might remember that it appears 12% smaller. So what does that mean for a solar eclipse? Well, if we have a solar eclipse during apogee, the moon will appear smaller. And as a result, when it moves in front of the sun, it does not completely cover the sun. And what we get is a very unique eclipse called an annular eclipse. And that annular eclipse blocks out most of the sun, but it leaves a bright glowing ring around the sun. And the reason we see that bright glowing ring around the sun has to do with the shadows. So again, the moon is a little bit further away, and when it's further away, the shadows don't line up in the same way. What we get is we get an area right here where light around the edge of the moon will come through, and so we're able to see that ring around the sun. That wraps up this section about eclipses. Let's go ahead and go back to our topics. Now we're going to talk about tides. Before we talk about tides, let's talk about sandcastles. Think about this. How many of you have ever built a sandcastle and you think you've picked the perfect spot because the waves come up, fill your moat with water, and then go back out? Or perhaps you've picked a spot and you think this is perfect. The waves are very far. I don't have to worry about them knocking over my sandcastle. And by the time you finish your sandcastle, two things happen. If you went with option one, now the waves are very far away and they're not filling up your moat. Or if you went with option two, the waves that were far away are now very close and they're washing away your sandcastle. Well, that changing of the ocean and the waves has to do with tides. So let's talk a little bit more about that. When we look at Earth and the moon from above, we can understand how the moon influences tides and our ocean. So let's think about this baseball here on Earth. If I take this baseball and I let go, it falls, and that's because gravity is pulling it towards the center of Earth. Well, the moon, just like Earth, has gravity. Not as much as Earth does because it has less mass, but there is still some gravity. And that gravity is pulling on Earth. Now, Earth is a very rocky planet, so it's hard to pull on different parts of it, but the easiest thing for the moon's gravity to pull on is the water in the ocean. So we get water that's bulging on the side of Earth closest to the moon. As Earth rotates, it also slings water to the other side of the planet, creating two bulges. And these bulges are the areas of high tide, where the water is going to be deeper. We also have two areas of low tide, where the water is lower. And if you look at this yellow dot, that yellow dot is me here on the west coast, and you can imagine that as Earth rotates over 24 hours, I'll move from a high tide area to a low tide area, and that'll keep going on. So you can see starting in a high tide, moving to a low tide, then back to a high tide, then to a low tide, and back to a high tide. Now many places around Earth have two high tides and two low tides separated by about six hours. Some areas will only have one high tide or one low tide, uh, but for the most part we can think of it in this way. In this picture, it looks like the high tide water is very, very high and the low tide water is much, much lower. However, on average, the difference between high tide and low tide is only about seven feet. So, enough to cause a problem when it comes to building sandcastles, but not quite as large as it might look in this image. There are, however, some places on Earth that have very, very dramatic high tides. The Bay of Fundy in Nova Scotia, Canada has the highest tide differences in the world. This is because of the shape of the bay and the bottom of the ocean. The difference can be over 50 feet. So let's take a look at the Bay of Fundy right here. This is during high tide when the moon's gravity is pulling up on the water. Well, six hours later, 
as the Bay of Fundy rotates into an area where the water is low, you can see the water is much, much lower. Let's take a look at these two images side by side. In which image is the moon overhead pulling up with its gravity? I'll give you a moment to think about that. All right, if you were thinking the image on the left, you are correct. Now the Bay of Fundy is not the only place that has high and low tide differences. At the top here, you can see a harbor in Amsterdam during high tide. Six hours later, you can see low tide. Here in the United Kingdom, you can see these beachgoers during low tide. And if they decide they're going to have a picnic, they better pick up their stuff and take it with them when they leave because six hours later, this entire area will be covered in water during high tide. So knowing the high tide and low tide is important for a couple of reasons. It can help you uh, keep your stuff from getting lost and help you when you're trying to build a sandcastle. But there are more important reasons that it's good to know when high tide and low tide arrive. Let's take a look at this picture. You can see this line of seaweed and debris along the beach. Now I can tell you that nobody came by with a broom and swept everything into a nice line there. Think about this for a moment. Why do you think there is a line of debris on the beach? All right, if you were thinking that it's because when the high tide waters rose, it pushed that seaweed up with the waves, you're right. That line is a marker that shows how high the high tide will actually get. And you can see it in this image as well. This line of debris is formed by the high tide pushing those sticks and seaweed and whatever else was floating in the water up to a point on the beach. If you look at this picture, you'll notice all of the boats are behind that marker. Why do you think the owners of these boats put them behind that marker line? I'll give you a moment to think about that. If you were thinking that they put those behind so that their boats wouldn't get washed away, you are correct. If the owners of those boats put it in front of the line during high tide, those boats would get washed out to sea. Over a billion people count on fish as their main source of protein. So the owners of these boats, who may be catching them for their family or for themselves or to sell to other people, really need to understand when the high tide is going to come in and how high it's actually going to come. Now, because the moon rotates around Earth, we get something very interesting that can happen during tides. This tide chart shows the difference between high and low tide over one month. Here, during full moon, here is last quarter, here is the new moon, and here is the first quarter. You'll notice that during full moon and new moon, there is a very large difference between the high tide and low tide, almost six feet. But during the last quarter and the first quarter, we see a difference of only about three feet. I want you to take a few moments and think about why that might be. All right, let's talk about why we see a greater difference between high tide and low tide during the full moon and new moon and less of a difference during the last quarter and first quarter. It has to do with the position of the moon during full moon, last quarter, new moon, and first quarter. During a full moon or a new moon, we have what's called a spring tide. And that's when gravity from the moon is combined with gravity from the sun to give an extra strong pull on the tides, giving us very high, high tides. During first quarter, and during last quarter, the moon's gravity is pulling in one direction and the sun's gravity is pulling in another direction. And that causes us to have a neap tide where the high tide and low tide differences are very small. Now I have another thing that I want you to think about. When the astronauts during the Apollo missions went to the moon, they put these reflectors on the moon. Now these reflectors are aimed in such a way that when here on Earth we shine a laser at those reflectors, they bounce off of those reflectors and bounce right back towards Earth. Now the time that it takes the beam to return is timed and we can measure the exact distance between Earth and the Moon. It takes about three seconds to travel to and from the Moon. 
we can measure this very precisely. However, every year, the time that we measure gets a tiny, tiny bit longer. What does this tell us about the moon? I'll give you a moment to think about that. All right, so the time it takes for that beam of light to travel between Earth and the moon and back gets a tiny bit longer. The speed of light hasn't changed. So when it takes longer for that light to get there and come back, that's because it's having to travel a further distance. That's right, the moon is moving away a very small amount. As we saw earlier, there are these two bulges of water on Earth. As Earth rotates, the friction drags that bulge forward just a little bit, and so that bulge is actually not directly under the moon. Two things are happening. Number one, that bulge is pulling on the moon, and the moon is pulling on the bulge. When the moon pulls on the bulge, it slows Earth down. When that tidal bulge pulls on the moon, it speeds the moon up. Now this has some interesting results. Because of this attraction, the moon moves away by about two inches every year. And Earth slows down by about two milliseconds per century. Four billion years ago, Earth's day was about five or six hours long, and the moon was 16,000 miles away. That's it for tides. Let's go ahead and go back to our moon topics. Now we're going to talk about craters. If you've ever looked up at the night sky and seen a full moon, you've noticed that it is covered in craters. What you might have also noticed is that there is only one side of the moon that we ever see from Earth. So what I want to do now is show you six images as we rotate around the moon to show all of the different craters on the moon. What you're seeing here is the far side of the moon. This is the side of the moon that we can't see from Earth. This image was taken by a spacecraft that was traveling on the far side of the moon. That's why we're able to see it. As we travel back to the front side, you'll see the face of the moon that you're more familiar with. Now there are many craters on the near side, or the side that you see here. In fact, if we were to count all of the craters, only one meter or greater in diameter, so bigger than this from one side to the other, we would be looking at over 500,000 craters just on the side facing us. If we were counting smaller craters or craters on the far side, the number would be even bigger. Now, one meter is kind of a small size for a crater. In fact, if we take a close look at the moon, we can see some very, very large craters. This is the Bailey Crater, the largest crater on the near side of the moon. The diameter of this crater from one side to the other is about 188 miles. So imagine having to drive across that. It would take you nearly three hours to get across. Now craters can be very big. They can also be quite small. If you look in this picture, you can see a very large crater in the center. But within that crater, you can see there are smaller craters inside of the larger crater. So, how do craters form? I want you to take a moment to think about that. Well, if you said that craters form when something crashes into the moon, you are correct. So, what does that look like? No, that is actually not what it looks like. That is a picture from the very first science fiction film, A Trip to the Moon, filmed in 1902. When I talk about things crashing into the moon, I am talking about rocks, space rocks, asteroids. These things reside mostly in the space between Mars and Jupiter, but sometimes they can get knocked out of their orbit. And when we talk about the size of these rocks, we're talking about some things that can be very, very large. If you look at the asteroids in this yellow ring, there is a very large one called Ida. It's about 10 miles from side to side. And there's a very small one called Dactyl. It's about 3 quarters of a mile across. The very large one you see taking up most of the screen, that one is named Letitia. And it is about 47 miles across. Now we had said that craters are formed when something crashes into the moon. Well, what happens when things crash going really fast? I'll give you a moment to think about that. 
Well, a lot can happen when something crashes going really fast. Here at NASA, we wanted to find out exactly what would happen when things crash going really fast. So when scientists at NASA have questions, they design tests to find the answers. So we took a jet and we flew it towards a wall at 500 miles per hour. Now don't worry, there was nobody in there. It was on autopilot and it was on a train track attached so that it wouldn't fly off course. But when it hit that wall, after the collision, all that was left was dust. Now 500 miles per hour is very fast. However, asteroids and comets hitting the moon, they might be traveling 30 or 40,000 miles per hour. As a result, they have a lot of energy. And when they hit the moon, that energy has to go somewhere. And that released energy becomes an explosion. It blows out that familiar shape of a crater that we're used to seeing in pictures. In very large collisions, the sides of a crater will slump, creating terraces, and the floor of the crater will rebound or bounce back up, creating a mountain in the center. Now, as you saw in the video earlier, asteroids and comets hitting the moon has slowed down a lot, but it's still happening. In fact, I have a video that I would like to show you that shows an asteroid hitting the moon. Now, you're going to have to look closely at this video. Down on the lower side of the screen, to the left hand side, there's going to be an arrow, and that arrow is pointing to where the flash will be. So let's take a look at that. So there's the blue arrow pointing. There's the flash of the explosion. And it was such a big explosion that that la flash lasted for eight seconds. Now this was a very large explosion. Let's take a closer look at it. This is the still image of it. Scientists calculated that the asteroid that hit was about one meter in diameter, so not very big, but it was traveling 40,000 miles per hour and it weighed about 880 pounds. The explosion was like 15 tons of dynamite going off and it created a crater that was 40 meters in diameter, so very, very big. Now when these explosions happen, they form a crater, but the material that's inside gets blasted out and what can happen is that you can see craters that form outside of craters because the material that gets blasted out has to land somewhere. Now this is the Daedalus crater and this is a great example of how those central peaks can form when the floor of the crater rebounds creating that mountain in the middle. Let's take a close look at one of these craters that has a mountain in the middle. This is the Solkovsky Crater, and the Solkovsky Crater has one of these very large mountains right in the middle of it. To give you an idea of just how big these craters are, let's take a look at the Tico Crater Central Peak. This is the mountain inside of the Tico Crater, and you'll notice there's a little, looks like a round pebble at the top of that peak. Well, we're going to get a closer look at that round pebble because it's no pebble. In fact, when we look really closely at it, we see a boulder that is actually the size of a baseball stadium. So the mountain that this boulder is on must be huge. All right, let's take a closer look at some more features about craters. When we look at a crater from above, this is the Copernicus crater, there are some interesting features the crater itself is only 50 miles in diameter. It's very deep, 2.4 miles, deeper than the Grand Canyon. But if you look closely at this image, you'll see that there are these white lines we call rays coming out from the crater. These lines are the debris that are blasted out of the crater when the asteroid hits. And these rays can be very, very long. In this case, the rays extend for over 500 miles. All right, we're going to do a little activity where you need to be crater scientists. So take a look at these different craters, crater A, crater B, crater C, and crater D. Think about what you know about how craters form. You know that they form when something slams into the moon, causing this large explosion. And I want you to think about which crater came first so be able to tell me which crater it was. 
but also be able to tell why. I'm going to give you a moment to pause and tell your teacher which crater you think formed first and why you think it formed first. Okay, we're back. If you said crater C, you are correct, and here's why. Crater C formed first, and you know this because the other craters formed on top of it, so they must have formed after crater C was already there. So crater C was formed, then craters B and D formed, and A came after crater B because it's even on top of crater B. Let's take a close look at some other craters. Again, we have craters A, crater B, and crater C. Look at these craters carefully and decide which two are most alike. Okay, welcome back. You may have said crater B and crater C are similar because they're both large compared to crater A, but I was looking for crater A and crater C as being similar because unlike crater B, they appear to have flat bottoms rather than rounded out bowl-shaped craters, which is what we have seen in so many pictures. And the reason for that has to do with magma or lava. If we look at the moon, there are these dark areas, and these dark areas are called maria or seas. And they're areas where magma has flowed out onto the surface and filled in some of these low areas. We'll darken it up a little bit to make it a little easier to see. Now you can imagine from the side what this might look like if there was a crater with magma below and some of that magma was able to seep out through a crack, that magma would fill up that crater. Now eventually that magma would cool and you'd have a flat surface. This isn't really happening now because the interior of the moon has also cooled, but what we see are these beautiful craters that have been filled in with magma that came out from inside the moon. And you can see here are some down here. This larger crater right here has also been filled in with lava that cooled. That's all for craters, so let's take a look now at our list of topics. Now let's talk about exploration of the moon. In all of NASA's history, only 12 humans have ever walked on the moon, and that was in the late 1960s and early 1970s. For 30 years, we explored using the space shuttle, and we continued to learn about living in space on the International Space Station. But going to the moon was something very unique and has only happened a few times. Let's take a look at how we did it. On the left-hand side of this image, you can see the first rockets that we used to launch humans into space. They're quite small compared to the Saturn V. The Saturn V was the largest rocket ever built, and it was built specifically for bringing humans to the moon. At the same time, the Soviet Union was trying to get to the moon, and they built the N1 rocket. However, the N1 moon rocket blew up after launch four times during testing, and the Russians never sent cosmonauts to the moon. Most of what you see in the Saturn V are fuel tanks and rocket engines. In fact, only a small compartment at the top of this 363 foot tall rocket contains humans. And that's this little cone shaped section up at the top. We can zoom into it up here and see there's room for three astronauts. Now they don't get to go into this section right here. This is called the service module. And that's where we have things like fuel, oxygen, and the systems that keep this spacecraft running. This cone is called the command module and that's where astronauts were seated during launch. This is the Lunar Excursion Module, or LEM, and that is what took two of the three astronauts down to the surface. Here you can see a Saturn V launching from the Kennedy Space Center. Now out of everything that you see in this picture, the only thing that went to the moon was the Command Module, the Service Module, and the Lunar Excursion Module. Now as I mentioned, two of the astronauts would go from the Command Module into the Lunar Module, and they would separate and they would fly down to the surface and land where they would put on their Apollo spacesuits. Now these Apollo spacesuits were designed to keep the astronauts safe on the moon. It had 17 protective layers. Now imagine that for a minute, having to wear 17 different layers. That seems like it could get pretty bulky, but it was very important that the astronauts wore these suits. They needed to be protected. I'm going to give you a moment and I want you to think about this.
What did they need to be protected from? I'll be right back. You've had a chance to talk about what astronauts needed to be protected from, and hopefully you said a few of these things. Temperature. The temperature changes between the sun and the dark on the moon can be as wide as 500 degrees. It can get as hot as 250 degrees or as cold as 250 degrees below zero. They also needed oxygen to breathe. That oxygen not only provided them with what they needed to survive, but it also provided pressure in their suit. We're used to it here on Earth, so we don't notice it, but there's constantly 14.7 pounds of pressure pushing down on every square inch of your body. Take that away, and we'll be in a world of hurt. So we needed to make sure that the astronauts were protected. There was also protection from micrometeors. Now, micrometeors are very, very tiny, sand-sized pieces of rock that are traveling through space that we needed to be protected from. Now, if you've ever had your arm out the window in a car and been hit by a bug, you know that that bug traveling maybe 30 or 40 miles per hour really hurts. Now, imagine that bug was a rock and imagine it was going 30,000 miles per hour and it becomes an entirely different scenario. So these 17 layers were required to help keep the astronauts safe. Now, those 17 layers did make it very bulky. So bending over to pick up rock samples was not very easy. In fact, you can see here, one of the astronauts was using a tool at the end of a handle so that he didn't have to reach down and pick up rocks. That bulky suit not only made it difficult to pick up rock samples, it also made it difficult to move around. What astronauts discovered that hopping was one of the easiest ways to get around on the moon. Now, the gravity on the moon is one-sixth that of the gravity here on Earth. So even though their suits were very, very heavy, here on Earth, when they went to the moon, the reduced gravity made it a little easier to walk around. Now, one thing you'll notice about these astronauts is that they tend to fall a lot. And fall, and fall, and fall, and fall. Fortunately, though, the reduced gravity makes it pretty easy to get back up as well. One thing that you'll always notice about astronauts is they look like they're having a good time on the moon. Even though they were very professional about their job and what they had to do and their mission, you'll often hear astronauts whistling and just having a really great time singing about their experience on the moon. Now, walking on the moon, lots of fun, but I think that driving on the moon would probably be even more fun. Here you can see a video taken by astronauts on a lunar rover. Now, some of the later missions Apollo 15, 16, and 17 all had these lunar rovers included in the mission and allowed astronauts to get around on the moon quite a bit easier. And I'll kind of give you an idea of what that looked like here. The rover folded up and was attached to the side of the lunar module. Now, after the astronauts were done exploring on the moon, they had to go back. Now, they launched from their lunar excursion module back up to the command and service module where one of the astronauts was waiting to reconnect with them. You can see Earth in the distance and that trip back was about three days to get back to Earth and when they did the only thing that returned to the surface was the command module with the three astronauts inside. You can see here the pressure and friction from re-entering the atmosphere raises the temperature to very very high temperatures, thousands of degrees. Fortunately the spacecraft was designed in such a way that allowed them to stay safe while they were in there. These were designed to land in the water, so these three parachutes were used to touch down safely into the water. Now what you see here are Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, and Buzz Aldrin. These were the crew members of the Apollo 11 mission, the first craft to land humans on the moon in 1969. Here they are in their 80s, with President Obama, there's Neil Armstrong, there's Buzz Aldrin, and there's Michael Collins. As I mentioned, it's been a long time since we've been to the moon, and only 12 men have ever walked on the moon. Now that doesn't mean that we've stopped exploring the moon. Quite the opposite. We have sent many, many robotic spacecraft to explore the moon. This is the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. The Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter uses visible light data and a laser altimeter to help us reconstruct the surface of the moon.
It also has a high powered camera that allows us to see different areas of the moon. This is the Apollo 12 landing site imaged by Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. To give you a better view, we have a video created from this imagery. Here we are zooming into the Apollo 17 landing site. As we get closer and closer, you'll start to see details appear. Moving towards the center of the screen, you can see the lander that they used to touch down on the surface. You'll also remember that Apollo 17 did have a lunar rover, and the lunar rover tracks you can see around there, in addition to astronaut footprints, that allowed the astronauts to get around and explore the surface of the moon. All right, well, that wraps up lunar exploration, and let's move back to our list of topics. Now we're going to talk about water on the moon. How many of you think there's water on the moon? All right, how many of you think there's no water on the moon? And how many of you aren't sure? Okay, well, that's all right. Scientists weren't sure either, and they had to figure out a way to determine whether or not there was water on the moon. Before we talk about that, though, I want you to think more in depth about water. Think about the extreme temperatures that astronauts faced and had to be protected from on the moon, and think about what those temperatures would do to water. And I want you to give extra thought to the exact temperatures, if you can, at which certain things happen to water. So I'll give you a moment to think about that. Alright, so you may have said that water will boil in the very hot temperatures and water will freeze in the very low temperatures. Specifically, water will freeze at 32 degrees Fahrenheit and it will boil at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So what does that mean for water on the moon? Well, water on the moon could not exist in a sunny area because if it was sunny, that water would boil and evaporate. So we need to think about a place on the moon that is dark. Where could that be? Well, think about a couple places on the moon you think might be dark, and I'll come back in just a moment. All right, so you may have mentioned a few different places on the moon, perhaps a cave or deep in a crater or on the far side of the moon. So let's take a look at a few of those different options using this model right here. I'm going to shine a light on this sphere to represent sunlight. Now if you said perhaps the far side of the moon, keep in mind that the moon rotates and anything on the far side will eventually encounter the light. Now if you said a crater, that might be a good place. However, keep in mind that a crater near the mid-latitudes or the equator of the moon will get sunlight shined into it. If there's a crater at the north or south pole, the sunlight will go right across the top and not down into it. So that provides a promising place where we might be able to find water in ice form. To give you an example, some of the deepest craters on the moon are as deep as 15,000 feet, nearly three miles deep, which is deeper than the Grand Canyon here on Earth. And that light would shine right across the top, leaving any potential ice cold and frozen. So how do we test the inside of a crater to determine whether or not there's ice in it? I'll give you a moment to come up with a few ideas about how that might happen. Well, here at NASA, we decided we were going to find one of these craters at the North or South Pole and crash something into it. As you remember from earlier, when something crashes into the moon going very fast, there will be an explosion that blasts a lot of material out. And if there's any ice in that crater, it will get blasted out. So we found a crater called the Cabeus Crater. It's this one right here. It's very dark, very deep, and it's near the South Pole. We were already going to the moon with the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter that you've heard a little bit about. We thought, since we are going there already, let's go ahead and attach a second satellite to this vehicle. And that's what you see here, LCROSS. LCROSS was designed to study what was going to be blasted out of that crater. And the object that was going to impact the crater and cause the explosion was the upper stage of this rocket. So we had these two items going to the moon. As they approached the South Pole, they were oriented so that the upper stage of the rocket could detach from the spacecraft and make its way to the Cabeus Crater. When it hit the Cabeus Crater, there was quite an explosion. It blasted a lot of material out 
and the satellite, LCROSS, was able to scan that material to determine what it was composed of. Now, there was one problem though. In order for LCROSS to fly through the dust, it had to be aimed in such a way that would guarantee it would smash into the surface. So LCROSS was not going to come back from this mission. In addition to flying through the debris that was blasted out of the crater, we were able to see what that impact looked like. If you look closely, there's a very faint dot here. I'll zoom in a little bit down in the lower left corner and zoomed in even more in the lower right, circled in yellow, is the flash from that impact. Now it left quite a big crater. This is the crater left by the impact and it is approximately 75 meters or 246 feet in diameter. And when LCROSS scanned the material that was blasted out of Cabeus Crater, it detected water. Not just a little bit of water, but a lot. In fact, based on the number of craters like Cabeus Crater, scientists have calculated there is enough water on the moon to fill one of the Great Lakes. We have Lake Huron, Lake Ontario, Lake Michigan, Lake Erie, and Lake Superior. I'll give you a moment to think about which one you think could be filled with all of the water on the moon. All right, if you guessed Lake Erie, you are correct. There's enough water on the moon to fill Lake Erie. Well, that wraps up water on the moon, and it's also the last of our topics. So from all of us at NASA, have a great rest of your day. Thanks for watching, bye-bye.